This is YG TV and YG Workshop, presented by First Federal Bank. I'm your host, David Bellman, president of Bellman Homes. Today, my team and I are collaborating to help Dan Nowak, owner and chef of Tall Guy in a Grill. Let's do this. Welcome to YG Workshop, presented by First Federal Bank and sponsored by Circle Electric and Health Payment Systems. YG Workshop presented by First Federal is just like it sounds. I bring together a panel of experts who work together to help an entrepreneur that is growing his company. Let's meet the panel. Hi, I'm Mervyn Bird. I am a Vistage Chair. I run a CEO peer advisory group here in the greater Milwaukee area. Hi, I'm Ariel Kopak with Harness Your Hindrance. I help business owners and sales professionals take control of the hindrances of their business that are getting in their way. Hi, I'm Lori Hybe, president and owner of Keystone Click. We're a strategic digital marketing agency helping our clients build brand awareness, generate leads, and nurture those opportunities online. Today, we are helping owner and chef of Tall Guy in a Grill, Dan Nowak. Let's meet Dan Nowak. All right, Dan, our panel is dying to know what is your origin story of your business? Sure. Well, uh, I'm not tall at all, so <laughs> it didn't, it didn't come from there. Are, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think like, uh, like a lot of entrepreneurs, you have something that you're passionate about, maybe as like a hobby or, or a side business. So um, growing up, my mom's side of the family is uh, from Sicily. My dad's side is from Poland. So food was a really big part of what we did growing up. And as I look back on my childhood, I think about, you know, all those family get togethers we had, all the food that we ate. And like a lot of kids, you know, they were maybe fascinated with toys around the holidays sure. or their birthday. And for me, it was always about helping my, my mom and my grandma and even my dad grill and do all that food. So um, I started this as a part-time business in 2009. Um, like anybody who gets in the food business, um, first you go to school and you get a finance degree in business school, right? That's, yes, that's, sure. That's the yeah, that's how you start to, a restaurant, right? To be a chef, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did that, um, worked with 401k plans out of college for a few years. and kind of realized that maybe that might not be my long-term career goal. Sure, it wasn't um, your passion, right? It wasn't my passion, yeah. So um, kind of came up with this as a little side business like anything else. We started doing things for family and friends. Um, by the time we got to around 2013, I was kind of at that breaking point for the business where I had to make a decision where I either had to quit my office job or I had to quit doing catering because it was just, I was taking all my vacation from my office to do catering yep. and it just, something had to, had to give. So obviously I, I left that finance career behind. Um, so a stable job, good paying job oh, to follow yeah. your passion. Exactly. I love it though. Yeah, That's it's a awesome. classic story of uh, everybody, like you kind of go all in, you cash in your savings, you go against the anti-business school thing, which is cashing in your 401k plan, which yep, is like, there you go. You're better anybody yourself, out there, though. don't do that. It's not <laughs> a good idea. Um, but you know, we, we figured like what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, we're still relatively young you know, pay off a little bit of debt if we have to, and I can go back and get that desk job if this doesn't work out. So um, opened up our first location in Tosa in 2013. So we were like around 72nd North, um, right in kind of the resurgence of the East Tosa area. Um, I tell people we did a whopping uh, two weddings in 2013. Okay. Um, and so kind of fast forward to last year, um, we had between full and part-time employees, about 33, 34 employees. Wow. Um, I bought a building in West Dallas in 2017. We completely gutted it all the way down to the studs, remodeled that. Um, and so now we did about 80 weddings last year. And um, you know, we have a full suite of services, anywhere from events from 10 people up to 1,000 people. Um, we're a farm to table caterer, um, meaning we source as much stuff as we can from the state of Wisconsin. So around half of our menu comes from the state. And I really tell people it comes down to good food and good service. I know it sounds super basic and maybe oversimplified, but if we just get those two things right, treat our customers and our staff and our employees right, and we put the time and effort to make food the right way, I think everything else will fall into place. Well, thank you, Dan. That's a fascinating story, and it sounds like you're doing a great job, but uh, we're here to help you, so we're gonna yeah. get to your pressing question in just a sec. We're just getting started. Let's take a quick break and come back for more with Ariel, Lori, Mervyn, and Dan. This episode of YG Workshop, presented by First Federal Bank on YG TV, is sponsored by First Federal Bank Circle Electric, and Health Payment Systems. Welcome to First Federal Bank of Wisconsin. Here at the bank, we pride ourselves on providing the community bank difference. To us, it's more than a tagline. It's how we serve our customers and support our communities. When you work with us, you can expect quick local decision-making, 
a great customer experience, and a significant community commitment. As experts in the products and services we provide, we are here to help you achieve your financial goals. Proudly serving the Milwaukee metropolitan area since 1922, we look forward to serving you and showing you what the community bank difference is all about. For more than 80% of families, today's medical billing practices are confusing. At HPS, our goal is to improve the healthcare experience for the patient by making medical bill payments less stressful. In Wisconsin, that's all made possible by our comprehensive independent healthcare provider network. We simplify billing and lower costs for everyone involved in healthcare and offer various ways for individuals to pay without breaking the bank. Circle Electric is a 35-year-old commercial, industrial, and healthcare electrical contractor with engineers and designers on staff backed by the most technical and well-trained master and journeyman electricians. Whether it's an equipment move, new build, or commercial remodel, all the way from pre-construction through startup. Primary power, branch power, or low voltage systems, we're here to support you. Our 24-7 on-call service department is here to meet your electrical needs for our healthcare and industrial customers. You always hear safety first. We are safety always. Circle Electric will maintain electrical reliability for business continuity. All right, Dan, so again, thank you for sharing your story. But I know you're here for a reason. You have a pressing question that's keeping you up at night. So what would you like to ask our expert panel here? Sure, I think, um, you know, obviously as an entrepreneur and a business owner, um, the thing on top of everybody's mind right now is still, you know, COVID and how we kind of make it through this year and into next year, um, especially for, you know, people like myself in the event industry. Um, caterers, venues, you know, planners, restaurants, all these places that got really hit hard. Um, you can go to hotels and things like that. Um, and so you never get into business to operate at a loss over the course of a year, right? So I find, but I find myself this year saying, you know, how can I lose the least amount of money going into next year? So I think the main question I have today is we all want to maintain our staff and keep all of our people. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have the revenue to generate that um, this year, and we've, we have pivoted and done a lot of different um, business lines. Um, I'm taking the, the mentality of trying to, you know, just keep my people on staff, um, knowing that I'm gonna operate at a loss, my labor cost is going up. And I think my question would be, you know, is that the right move? Is it okay to say, you know, in, a, in a, the state that we are right now with this, with this pandemic, is it okay that I'm having this mentality of I'm going to be operating at a loss this year and taking on that extra labor cost? That's a fantastic question, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But I know our panel wants to dig a little deeper before we get to that. So I'm going to turn it over first to, to Mervin. You're our business expert, our planning guy here. So do you have a question for, for Dan that you want to ask? I do. So Dan, you, the question that you ask us is, is it okay for you to operate at a loss this year? What kind of cushion do you have for your business to be able to sustain and carry sure. that loss? Um, we did. Um, we were fortunate enough to get um, you know one of the PPP loans, um, and we um, thankfully the they extended that deadline from eight weeks to twenty four weeks to spend that. So we did have um, PPP money that we were using actually through um, about the last week or so. So we're at about mid July here. Um, we did also get. Um, you know, one of the economic disaster loans too, that was also part of the government programming. Um, so we do have a large chunk of that money saved up, um, you know, access to um, a fairly large line of credit that currently is all the way paid down. And we do have, um, the nature of the way we, we do our, our weddings, we get a lot of deposits from customers ahead of time. Um, so if we need to tap into some of those deposits, we can, but again, that's, that's money we've gotten this year that we'll be spending on events next year. So I'm a little bit hesitant to pull into there. If we, if we do need to, we can, but I feel you know, pretty confident that you know, the amount of cash we have right now should carry us over into the next spring, summer season. Perfect, thank you. So Ariel, you are our mindset guru here, and uh, part of that question I think involves mindset. So do you have any questions? It certainly does. So Dan, at what point financially, would you go crazy if you were at that number for your business? At what point would it be too much to handle if you were at a loss? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the way that I've kind of tackled it, the reason why I, I think I'm 
okay with this this year is that we are taking the time right now to go through some projects that we typically didn't have. We have a couple different business lines that we're getting into. We're gonna be spinning off our, our liquor license to do a standalone bar business. We're gonna be revamping our website, which is a little bit overdue for a little bit of a refresh. Um, and then actually, um, um, our executive chef and I have partnered up on a new business venture um, that's gonna be like a mobile pizza trailer. It's a wood-fired pizza oven. So again, as food trucks have kind of seen a nice steady business this year, we're trying to diversify revenue streams. So none of that is bringing in money for me right now. But I think I've convinced myself that spending that money right now and the time, as long as I have it before next year when we're completely insanely busy, hopefully, fingers crossed yet, um, that all those investments will pay off. All right, thank you. Lori, you're our marketing expert here on the panel. What would you like to ask Dan? Um, yeah, lots of questions, but I'll focus on uh, <laughs> one specifically around um, the employees because Obviously, you are passionate about not only what you do, but taking care of your team as well, and I think that's very noble of you. Um, what are you doing to maximize their time right now, more so from a marketing perspective? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things that um, you know, has been on our list for a while is you know, trying to focus our, um, kind of highlight our staff a little bit more, um, which I still haven't done that good of a job yet um, this year, full disclosure. So. Um, I think uh, you know, one of my plans for the rest of the year is um, going to some of these weddings that we're still doing, much smaller guest count um, than we're used to, but um, taking those behind the scenes photos and really telling people um, you know, that we, we do have fun at work. Um, you know, this is all the production it takes. Everyone sees those beautiful plates of food on Instagram. Like we are definitely one of those people that has all those awesome pictures out there, but who are the people that are doing all that stuff too? And I think um, just by doesn't have to be anything fancy, but I think I need to do a better job of some of that behind the scenes and telling their stories a little bit. So, so Dan, I have a quick question for you as well. You said uh, in 2019 you did about 80 weddings. How many are you anticipating in 2020? And then I know you alluded to the guest count kind of going down. Um, sure. What are you seeing this year with, with that as well, with guest counts compared to previous years? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like we, we were set to do about the same amount of weddings this year. Um, if I were to, to take a guess, um, I think in my numbers last week, we were we maybe down to like around 50-ish weddings for the year. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say last year, if, you know, the average guest count was, let's, let's call it 175 or 200 people, you know, it's rare that we're getting above 100 people this year, which, um, again, uh, it's safer, you know, from sure. a lot of people, you're having a, you're, so, so your people, challenge though is not only do you have half the volume, but you also, you know, as far as events, but you also have potentially half the guests that you're normally serving. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So there is some money going out too with some refunds that, um, you know, our contracts, typically we don't have to give refunds to people, but again, people that have had health situations pop up due to COVID or um, they just decide it's, it's not the, the safe choice for them and their particular family that we've been flexible with doing some of that too. So not only is there reduce revenue from the actual weddings that we're doing. There's also some of that money um, going out back to our customers too. Gotcha. Okay, so back to your original question, Dan, for the panelists. Um, your question was obviously COVID has impacted your catering business. You are trying to decide how to minimize your losses, but yet maintain the quality staff that you have. And at what point do you have to, to make those, those tough cuts? I think that's sure. your question, right? All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mervin first. I have another question. Oh, sure. Okay, you're going to ask another question? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. And, and this is it's, it's not a financial question at all. So, yeah. Dan, what are you most afraid of here? I think um, maybe losing one or two key staff. I don't even know if I'm afraid of that. I think it's, um, I think the big thing is we're all um, in the event industry putting all of our eggs in the basket of 2021. Um, you know, what happens if, you know, there is no vaccine for COVID or people are still scared to get back together next year. You know, we do have um, those other business lines I talked about, but it's really, um, when we did some of our pop-up menus and we did some of these curbside um, carry out, um, that stuff brought in some money, but the, the model for the business doesn't work with um, the amount of money we pay our, our top people because we just we need to do that to maintain them and they do a great job too and they're the key people for the business so if we're not able to do large events next year um, we don't have that revenue and then it doesn't make sense to have yeah, those and the danger is you can't be something to everybody at the end yeah. of the day you know and that's I think what you're finding out which is it's, a, it's good that you're recognizing that right yeah. away 
Uh, do any of you have any other questions for him before we, we start uh, giving him some advice? I'm curious, um, you, you mentioned you're kind of exploring different types of revenue generating opportunities. Um, has anything really stood out though that, that pushes you to want to go more down that route? Yeah, I think the, you know, the one thing we got from, uh, so we did a series of pop-ups um, outside the front of our, our store on a, on a busy street. Um, about two thirds of the business for that came from just people driving by and seeing us and then neighbors coming over and saying, hey, we've never had your food before because we strictly do large events. So I think that it was reassurance that our food is good, um, we have a, a good product, and I think doing some of these things, uh, especially with the, you know, the wood fire pizza trailer that's highlighting um, our executive chef who's kind of the, taking the lead on that brand and the majority owner of that, um, that business. Um, I think getting that word out to the public more that they can, they can try our food, maybe they've heard about us, but then that may also feed into the catering side of things as well. Sure, it's a good teaser to the catering, but yeah, it's yeah. letting people know it is, exists though. Yeah, that, that's and something like that's part. a little bit more flexible with uh, you know, not having to gather large groups of people. Um, like I mentioned before, I know a couple of food truck owners in the area and their business has been um, about the same as last year. So that's, that's good. Any other questions? One last question. Sure. What are you doing now to plant seeds and incentive for people to utilize your catering in the future? Staying front of mind for them when sure. events get larger. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's the fact that, that we've been open the whole time, that we've been, we never completely shut down. We did, unfortunately, had to lay off um, you know, 20, I think 20 or 21 people on my staff, and I kept my, you know, my sales manager and my executive chef. But, um, we did stay top of mind. We, um, a big part of our business is giving back to the community too. So we were feeding frontline workers and um, we worked with uh, Caitlin Collin at the Tandem who was um, doing meals to feed the community. So we try to do as much as we can to kind of stay top of mind for people. And I, I heard another entrepreneur say, uh, you know, 2020 is all about survive in advance. You know, the fact that you're still gonna be there and that we are still putting content out there, like, hey, we're still doing weddings this year, we're still doing food, like, we still have people coming into work and focusing on some of my people that have been with me for a while and, and kind of with us through the pandemic. So I think that'll make a difference going into next year. Fantastic. So, uh, Mervin, do you have some advice for Dan to help him? Uh, I do, okay. I do. So Dan, here's what I, if I were in your shoes, here's, here's what I would do. I would take each of those lines of business that you have and I would run scenarios. Worst case scenario, the, figure out what those numbers are and where you would wind up. Best case scenario, and then kind of a realistic scenario. And run, the, run each and every one of those. Sit down with your accountant if you need to do that, but run those scenarios to understand what type of losses you'll be talking about or perhaps what type of gain you may get out of it. And then that will let you get your comfort level uh, to Ariel's question, where would you go crazy? I mean, seeing those numbers on paper might make you, <laughs> right? yeah. might make you go, oh my gosh, yeah. you know, this is, yeah. I can't handle this, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, having a plan for the best case and worst case, I think that's a fantastic way to go. Because at least when you have a plan, you have some guidance on where you're going to go. Sure. And I think that's, that's a spot on advice for, for any situation. And because you have so many business models and you have new business models that you're creating right now, you really got to have those planned out and, and know those situations. Sure. All right, Ariel, what, what thoughts do you have for, uh, for Dan here? So Dan, I think there's an opportunity here to share with your market that you're not only surviving, but that you're thriving. And a way to do that is to share with them what they may receive from you both now and in the future. Because you're thinking not only about the present, but also about the future. You want your clients to be thinking about the present and the future. So something like incentivizing them to buy from you now at a smaller portion, as for a smaller group, that creates a coupon or a credit for a future larger event at a minimum amount. So that when that event comes, they are coming to you. Because they already have that credit, they already have that coupon, they already have the experience of your amazing food and service, and you serve them at a time when they didn't have as many options. You were there for them. So I think that might be a great way to think it's not a question of if we will survive, we will survive. And we're going to make sure that our clients know that. That's how you can take control of not only your mindset, but your clients' mindsets as well. Fantastic advice. Like Thank you, Ariel. 
Lori, what advice do you have for Dan? Yeah, I love what Ariel and Mervyn both said. I think there's fantastic insights there. Um, one of the things you said earlier, you spoke to just the events industry as a whole. Um, I think you should look at a way to partner and collaborate and cross promote each other so that you're elevating the entire industry and not just your business. And um, to piggyback a little bit on what Ariel said, but really go back to the customers that have raved about you. Oh, your food is amazing. Build this list and continue to nurture them and remind them that you're here, you're thriving, and encourage them to spread the word as well because that referral from someone else is gonna go way further than you just preaching to the, the world that you're still alive. Sure. You've got this. Yeah. Yep. That's fantastic advice as well. And I'm gonna give you some advice as well. So, you know, one of the things when you have a good team, you know, you build a good culture in your company and you have to let them know we're all in this together, right? Um, they need to be a part of, of those decisions sometimes. And it sounds like you're doing the right thing by, you know, looking at these business models and, and, and making them, you know, partners and invested in it. And they're going to appreciate that because they understand that a lot of other businesses are struggling. But when you make them a part of it and they're a part of that team, then you're going to all work together and they're going to be loyal to you because what's going to happen is we are going to get through this. And people want to get together. They want to go out to eat. They want to celebrate in larger groups. And there's going to be a huge pent up demand. So you're in survival mode right now. You've got to survive first and foremost. And yeah, sometimes you've got to make tough cuts. A lot of businesses have. You're not the only one, but you've got to do it. Um, so you know, keep that in mind. You want to keep your core people, obviously. Keep them invested in what you're doing. But you know, if you've got to make a tough cut, you've got to do it. Because ultimately, if you can't run your business, if you have to close down your business, now everybody in your company is out. So that's first and foremost. And it's tough. It's a hard place to be. Yeah. All right, so Dan, we've given you some advice already. What have you taken away from this so far? Have you gotten anything that you think you might put to use right away? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, all the way up and down the panel, I think from, you know, upping my game a little bit on the, the marketing side of things, um, all of the thoughts we had about the, about the coupon and engaging those loyal customers. And then, you know, my CPA is my best friend right now because she's, we're getting caught up on financials. And again, that kind of plays to my finance background a little bit. So but also realize as we've grown as a business, like I don't have all the answers financially, so you gotta rely on those experts too. So um, yeah, I got a lot of stuff to work on, even more stuff to work on now. <laughs> I don't know if it makes like, right? a lot or, you know. Well, fantastic, Dan. Thank you so much for sharing your awesome story. You are doing a fantastic job. You know, you are trying to make all the right moves. You run a wonderful business. You've got great reviews and uh, you just gotta weather the storm and things are gonna get better. Right. Thank you for being on YG Workshop today. Thanks to Dan Nowak for sitting down with YG Workshop, presented by First Federal Bank and sponsored by Circle Electric and Health Payment Systems. YG Workshop is a collaborative environment designed to help businesses see through their blind spots, consider new perspectives, and grow toward their goals. Do you know an entrepreneur that would like to come on the show? Have them visit younggunsmovement.com and apply. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single episode of YGTV. I'm your host, David Bellman, president of Bellman Homes. Thanks to our panel of Mervyn, Ariel, and Lori, and our entrepreneur, Dan Nowak. See you next time. <laughs>